I didn't print more of these. But those of you who got. That's what I asked you to do, yes. So here we are tonight. Here we are. I can get you another one, but I, don't, I couldn't print it today. <laughs> this is not printing back to back as I asked you to do. The storm is holding off until 1 a.m. That's in two minutes and eight. That's good. We'll get all the way. Right. Oh, so it's in the yeah, they, that's one set. So you need to take, oh, that one didn't print back to back, but all the rest are. Okay. Oh, this might be your This one. Yeah. Might be the original. Okay, I'll take another one. what I hope to do tonight. We'll see. How's Jared doing? Is he back yet? He's back and um, he's, he's doing fine. Uh, so much. He's doing okay. Uh, Nicholas is in Israel. He landed Monday night. Oh, great. <coughs> and, uh, but if you want to just see one of his hands die. Oh, right. But if you want to pray for somebody who's really in bad shape, Pray for uh, Ike's nerve, because Ike's father has been through ten years. Well, yeah, ten years of every kind of cancer treatment possible, and this afternoon we found out that there's nothing more that can be done. So it was a mess. This afternoon. Did that man come back okay with the stress once the ambulance? Yes. Uh, yeah, pray for him. Yeah, that's Sam. Is time for support. People are really in bad shape. Yeah, this is It's going to be cold. Winter. And we just passed the midpoint of winter, like a week ago or something. Yeah. Uh, the uh, 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 February second is forty days. It's forty days from Christmas, and it's halfway to between the two solstices. All right. So we've been uh, two weeks ago. We talk about we talk about Samuel, um, who who in the in the in the Old Testament Samuel is the um, the last of the judges. So you heard the story of of um, Deborah on Sunday if you were at the Adult Forum. Um, the only woman mentioned in the whole list of judges in the book of Judges. Only one person is known as a prophet. And that's Deborah. All the others are just judges. And if you remember, a judge is a charismatic no prophet. Yes, yeah. the only prophet in the book of Judges, male or female. Well, there's prophets at this time. The Old Testament is prophets. Lots of prophets in the Old Testament. Males and females. They call now prophetess or so prophet. Only when they're translated into English. <laughs> Otherwise, they're just prophets. The, the word prophet is um, uh, nabi, N-A-B-I, um, and uh, nabi'im in plural. Right. English translation, we put men, we, we, add, we, yeah, we do, female. we like to so add. They yeah. A lot of other certain countries don't do it, and they right. female in the titles. Right. We're working on that. Pastor is a neutral term. Um, so, um, Deborah is mentioned as a prophet, that is someone who, who, who can um, uh, discern the will of God, is the best way to put that. Not predict the future, but discern what God is doing in, a, in, in the situation. And no other person, no, no, no other judge in the book of Judges is named a prophet, except Deborah, who um, uh, seems to have a dual role. In, in that piece of history, uh, namely, uh, a judge, uh, what, what makes a judge a judge, besides being a charismatic military leader in times of crisis, is that they figure out disputes among people. Um, they do justice. Uh, Deborah's the only one of those who's a prophet. And then, Sam, when you get to the book of Samuel, which is the next book, well, Judges, Ruth, and Samuel, Samuel is got a triple role. Samuel is a judge. He 
He's also a priest. Remember, the story of his call is that he's um, he's uh, in the temple, in a temple, working for a priest, Eli, and his family. Here so, I am. Here I am, right. So he's a priest as well. He offers sacrifice. There's the stories in Samuel, in the beginning of 1 Samuel, that we started last week, uh, two weeks ago, show him um, going from place to place, <coughs> offering sacrifice. Then the, the last thing he is, is a prophet. He's another one who's, whose role amongst the nation is to... Um, uh, figure out what God's doing in any given place. So, um, uh, first he anoints Saul to be the king, and later on he's going to tell Saul, God, is, God isn't happy with God's choice of you, so we're going to switch kings. Um, he's got all those roles. Um, and, and, and is viewed that way by the people. Um, and he's a transition, he's the transition figure. This is like the, this is like the, the, the hinge. So up until Samuel, it's a kind of a loose confederation of people that get together for defense. And then after, at the time of Samuel and afterwards, the hinge goes this way and now it's a nation. Remember I called it an Amphictyonic League? Amphictyonic League? That is a loose confederation of people <clears throat> with a with a central uh, um, uh, cult. That, that's not a bad word. Religious uh, center. <clears throat> There's moved. It was the ark, um, but no national identity. Well, after this, it begins to develop a national identity, and that's what we're going to hopefully see tonight um, with the story of. Um, the first real king of Judah and Israel put together, and that's David. So, first thing is, um, I want you to see that um, this part of the Bible is not in any good order. To tell this story, there's, the order is all messed up. So, in 1 Samuel 28, it tells us that Samuel dies. <coughs> so the end of 1 Samuel, well, it's sort of the end. Um, it's um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, Ruth, chapter 20, first, first Samuel, chapter 28, verse 5, 3. It's on the list, they gave you. Yeah, it's on the Sorry, list. It's no. on the list. Sonny, it's right, the first sentence here. So, just to put this in context, in this part of the story, Saul is functioning as the king, remember I told you that the word is prince there, of this group of people that we're eventually going to call Israel. Um, the, the, the whole story of David, including his anointing by Saul, has happened by the time, when by Samuel, has happened by the time Samuel dies. Samuel had to be there to anoint him. So there's a whole chunk of Bible I'm skipping here, which is stuff you know about. You know about Saul, and you know about um, uh, David, you know the story of David being the shepherd and getting anointed. We're gonna get to that yet. Um, and you know, Goliath's story and a bunch of other stories. Um, and and so, so pick, try to picture this scene. You have Samuel, who's still functioning as the charismatic rule, uh, judge, priest, and prophet, functioning. He's doing his thing. Saul, the one he first anointed, is functioning as the military leader slash king, King Saul. And David has been anointed king by Samuel and is functioning in Saul's court. So you sort of have to have, in a sense, you have three uh, different um, uh, leaders functioning simultaneously. Um, Samuel is revered by everyone. 
Saul is hated by most, but has the military power. And David is everybody's darling. Um, and is starting to get people to, uh, people are starting to see David, uh, by the time we get to chapter 28 here, as a, um, as the real power. The one who, you know, there's a song in there somewhere, Saul has, has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands. So people are starting to compare them both, and Saul is not coming out favorably in this. Um, and then, so, so, so Saul and David are kind of at, kind of, they're very much at odds with each other. There are two, two stories about Saul and David um, in which Saul tries to kill David. Um, and, and ultimately David is driven out into the desert and ends up being a bandit. We don't talk very much about this either, but, but David actually is so um, strongly di driven away by Saul that he goes and becomes a vassal, bandit vassal uh, leader of, um, of the Canaanites. He's, a, he's, a, he's, he's leading the enemy. He's a traitor. So that's going on here, and now Samuel dies. So I'm just going to read a little bit of this. <clears throat> now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. Saul had expelled the mediums and the wizards from the land. So, no more Harry Potter. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. Saul gathered all of Israel and they camped at Gilboa. Mount Gilboa is a very famous, important mountain in the middle of Israel. Um, a lot of battles happen there and a lot of, um, of personal encounters with God happen there. So when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly, uh, which is normal for Saul. When Saul inquired of Yahweh, and Yahweh did not answer him, not by dream or by Urim, I want to get back to that, or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servant, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. The servant said to him, There is a medium at Endor. So you know the witch of Endor? Yeah. This is her. Saul's in trouble. So Saul goes to the witch um, and says, um, I want you, he says to the witch, uh, consult a spirit for me and bring up for me the one whom I named to you. And the woman said to him, because she doesn't recognize him, quote unquote, surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the wizards from the land. Why then are you laying a snare for my life? bring about my death. But Saul swore by Yahweh, as Yahweh lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? He answered, Samuel. And then she figured out who he is, and she brings up Samuel, and if you go to verse 15, then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, for the Saul said, I'm in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. So I've summoned you to tell me what I should do. And Samuel lays into him in ways you can imagine, and says in verse 17, key, key verse, Yahweh has done to, to, done to you just as he spoke by me. For Yahweh has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of Yahweh and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Am Amalek, therefore Yahweh has done this to you today. Moreover, Yahweh will give Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your son shall be with me, that is, dead. And Yahweh will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. So this is where Saul has cut off all of his connections to God. And God is furious with Saul. 
A, he's, Saul's been disobedient. B, now he's done the very thing he's not supposed to do. He's talking to the dead. Don't read too much into that. And just let me go back to Urim. The decision is not made by dreams or by prophets, but by Urim. So it's a wonderful piece of Bible uh, trivia. There's a, it happens in Exodus, um, and then it shows up here. There was a third way to find out what to do, what God's will is, besides um, uh, prophets and dreams. And the third way is, is called Urim, U-R-I-M, and Thummim, T-H-U-M-M-I-M. You can Google them. Um, we don't know what they are, but what it sounds like is stones which you throw as lots. Yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of a game, because right. they talk about games, or, or, right. and the archaeologists are yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Urim and Thummim yeah. is, and you, you throw them out, you look at what it says, and you know, you, obviously it's sort of like a computer, it's one and zero, the answer is either yes or no. Should I fight the Philistines? No. So, but nothing is giving him an answer. He's getting even that, which has to give you one of two answers, isn't working for him. Is Somewhere I, like, I'm sorry, is it something like the Oracle of Delphi? Okay. Or, 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 or who said, who said um, ruins? I did. Yeah, okay. something like, you know, reading the ruins. But we, we have no idea. It's yes, described yes. As, as a way to make decisions. And it's one of the three ways in the Hebrew scriptures um, to find out what God's will is. Urim, U-R-I-M, and Thummim, T-H-U-M-M-I-N. What did the other two? Prophecy or dreams. And those are legitimate ways acceptable to God. But calling on the dead, not so acceptable. How do you spell the second one? Urim? T-H-U-M-M-I-M. Oh, Why is calling on the dead not acceptable? M -M -I -M. What? Why is calling on the dead not acceptable? Because it's not. I don't know. I mean, there's not, that wasn't connected to some other nope. religion at the time. Or? Not any other religion. The dead are supposed to be dead. Yeah, well, touching the dead, is they're unclean and all that, that so, you know, this, that stuff. So. At any rate, I just, that, it has no purpose in tonight's conversation except to say it's a bit of biblical trivia. Once in a while it shows up in a crossword. <laughs> John Dom had a great way of using this thing here. Uh, when the chapel was built, uh, there were vestments made for the chapel, also designed by Louise Nevelson. And there was a part of the vestment, I've seen a picture of it, I've never seen it, was a square maquette, which had a, yet another uh, cross on it, another, like the gold you know, cross in the front. This one was a crucifixion. Um, I'd say it's about this big, and it had a chain on it, and when you wore the, I can't imagine doing this, but there's a picture of Ralph Peterson doing it. When you wore the right uh, chasuble, this thing sat on your chest, and um, he makes a big, Ralph makes a big deal of it, of it. You know, this was a crucifixion, the resurrection is the other one. The third one that he expected to have somewhere near was that there was a was a um, a transfiguration. In fact, Ralph says that the chapel was not supposed to be the chapel of the Good Shepherd, but the chapel of the Transfiguration. At any rate, John Don called this piece Urim and Thummim <laughs> and refused to wear it. Where and was it now? We don't know. Uh -oh. It seems it's one of these great folkloric things about St. Peter's where it's in the ark. when John Dons came <laughs> and they started to do sung liturgies yeah. in the chapel. Before that they were all spoken. Yeah. He had the hearts accord moved into the chapel. And the story is that when um, the people who owned the gallery that was, were the conservators of Louise Nevelson saw the round harpsichord they took away the stuff, and they took away their blessing on the chapel. Um, and now we got to consult the dead. So, um, okay. So, but the, just this is uh, way off the subject. But it's Urim and Thummim. If you ever hear it, it's really they seem to have been dice, and I think they ended up in. Um, I think in 
somewhere in First and Second Samuel, these things end up in the ark with everything else. And of course, they're all gone now. It has something to do with investments, right? Mm -hmm. Those those stones, because they mention those in the, when they're talking about how to make yeah, investments. Yeah, they're, they're, they're described with the, with investments, and the priest handles those. So anyway, so so Samuel is dead, and ultimately Saul's going to be dead. But in, before all this happens, they, he anoints David king. So look at, now I have to take you backwards, and to become king, David has to have three separate anointings. He's the only one who has three separate anointings. The next one, the, the next time around, nobody gets anointed. Well, they don't get anointed. They do get anointed, but they, uh, it's only once. And the next time around, it's, the, it's uh, David's grandson, and he ends up splitting the kingdom of Israel and Judah in half. But I want you to look at the three anointings, um, and that's why I have that here. So it's about, just to put this in perspective, it's about 1,000, maybe 980 BCE. Um, I, when, when I saw Nicholas on, on Monday night, I did one of my usual over-the-top descriptions of one place he should go to, which is right outside of the, um, the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem, is the newly excavated and more and more and more um, uh, uh, clearly excavated City of David. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that, well, the last time I saw it, it's, you could actually tell it was a city, not just a bunch of rocks piled up together. And they've actually now uncovered what they think is David's palace. Um, so this is the real stuff. This isn't, you know, this is the archaeological bedrock, if you will. Um, and we'll get to how we get to that city. But first, if you look at Sam, uh, 1 Samuel 16, uh, verses 1, you have 16 inches, 1 to 13. That must be the snow uh, cover. No, uh, 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13. All right? Remember, this is way before Samuel dies, so this is a live Samuel running around. <laughs> Yahweh said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Because Samuel is upset that he made a mistake. I picked the wrong guy. I have rejected him. I have rejected him from being king over Israel. <coughs> Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Beth Bethlehemite, for I am provided for myself a king among his sons. All right. So notice some important things for the New Testament. He's going to, whom is he going to? Jesse uh, the Bethlehemite. So where does Jesse live? Beautiful downtown Bethlehem. So this story is very important for the story of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. This is the family tree here. This is the way. And, and what does David get? What, what is... What is uh, Samuel going to do? He's going to anoint David king. Word for anoint in Hebrew is translated into our language as Messiah. When you are anointed, you become Messiah. So, look at all that in one sentence. There's Jesse. Ever hear of a Jesse tree? It's, if, if you haven't seen one, go to the museum. Go to... Um, Yes, the Museum of Nash, uh, uh, the, the Met, and goes underneath the stairwell into the place where the Christmas tree is. You know, the, that section is, I think, medieval, medieval art. And so we, when you walk you toward the tree, go to your left, and you'll see a stained glass window. It's a gorgeous stained glass window, 11th century, and it's a Jesse tree, long, and you have this tree in the middle uh, with all these little people on the ends. And it starts at Jesse at the bottom, and out of his stomach comes all these branches, and every king of, of Judah is on there. Then they get a little fuzzy up on top because ge genealogy is bad, and at the very top is Jesus. It's a really cool thing. So Jesse, Jesse tree, you have Bethlehem, mm -hmm. um, and you have anointing. So why does Jesus have to be born in Bethlehem? Because this story is the basis for that that story. Just a little piece of connection here. 
Messiah. Not king. Oh. Anointed to be the Messiah. Everybody was anointed. So. Everybody gets anointed. And that makes them God's chosen. That makes anointing and but that doesn't make them all children of David. Remember, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is described as Son of David and Messiah. Not in Luke, not in Mark, not in John. Because only in Matthew, because Matthew is making the explicit connection to the king of Judah. So when Jesus is crucified in Matthew, it's very important that the placard is king of the Jews. It's not quite as important in Luke and Mark. It's there, but it's not quite as important. All right. Um,